Coming up on Inspiration Today. The letter Yud, which is the first letter of God's name, Yahweh, and the letter Sheen, the 21st letter of the Hebrew alphabet, being the shape of the mountain that the temple would be built on in Solomon's day. Stay tuned. Welcome to Inspiration Today. I'm so excited that you've joined us today. Perry Stone is with us again today, and we've been talking all of last week and continuing again this week about the mysteries of the temple, the breath of the holies. Perry's really been bringing such great revelation and insight to us on the patterns and the symbolisms and the mysteries of the temple that God is literally revealing to us. I'll tell you, I'm hearing things last week and yesterday even on the program. I've never heard before. So get yourself a pad of paper, a pen to write with. You're not going to want to miss a single moment of today's program. Perry's the president of Voice of Evangelism Ministry, and I'm just excited and happy that he's my friend and here with us for another week on the program. Please welcome with me again, Perry Stone. Yeah. Perry, Hello, David. bless you, my brother. Bless you. You're looking sharp today. You know, I, I, it's... Uh, we're in a studio, but it's cool. It's, <laughs> so it's not I, just cool, it's, it's cold. cold in here. <laughs> so I put my coat on. But uh, we've have, we're having a wonderful time. And for those of you who may have just tuned in, you know, last week we did a series on the Tabernacle of Moses. And I mean, barely scratched the surface. That's and that's, right. I, I got a feeling that's kind of what's going to happen here because there's so many, I call them rabbit trails when I'm preaching. You know, you get started and you, you feel an inspiration to go in a certain direction. But uh, you could take just one little piece of furniture and deal with all of the symbolism and the meaning yes. and the, the juice, as we like to call yes. it sometimes, of what God's really trying to say to us in the in, in that Absolutely. item. Absolutely. Yeah. And what I'd like to do today is in a moment go to one piece of furniture. And before I do, I want to go back to this building of foundation again. We talked about yesterday about the mountain called Mount Moriah. You know, there was Mount Ophel, which was at the base of the hill. Mount Zion, which was north of Mount Ophel, and then Mount Moriah, which was at the top of the mountain. And of course, I, I won't have time to do this today on this program, but all three of those mountains are prophetically speaking to us of the progression we have in God, from salvation to deliverance to the infilling of the Spirit or the glory of God. Now, having said that, we talked the other day also about the name of God being carved on the mountain naturally. The letter Yud, which is the first letter of God's name, Yahweh, and the letter Sheen, the 21st letter of the Hebrew alphabet, being the shape of the mountain that the temple would be built on in Solomon's day and later in Herod's day. And we want to point out here that there were actually two different temples that were built in Jerusalem. Right. One was built by King Solomon, the son of David. And what David did is during his time of war, he would go out and collect all the spoil of war. He had it in uh, actually set aside and he gave that gold and silver and that wealth to Solomon. He actually started collecting the, the, the bounty, the offering yeah, if you will, the offering, yeah. so that his son could build the temple. So his somewhere. son Solomon could build the he temple. He knew he was a man it, of war, he had bloody hands and God wasn't going to let him build the exactly temple. That's exactly right. David wanted to build the temple but yeah. the Lord said you're a bloody man so he allowed Solomon to do it. Now Solomon, it took six years to actually do it but, it, but seven, the, about, about the conclusion of the seventh year there was a dedication process which took place and the Temple of Solomon was dedicated during the Feast of Tabernacles, during a whole seven days of solid celebration according to the Old Testament. Now, that Temple of Solomon, which, which didn't necessarily have all these chambers, it had the Eastern Gate, probably another gate coming in from the East, which we have similar here, and then we had the Holy Sanctuary itself. That was destroyed by the Babylonians. But, but when the Jewish captives came back from Babylon, which was Nehemiah and Ezra, Ezra Nehemiah that's Ezra. right, they began to build on the platform out of the rubble. They, they rebuilt the walls, they right. rebuilt the temple. That's, that's right. right. And they ended up rebuilding the building. So we can assume, because they remembered what Solomon's looked like, that the one that was built in, Herod, in what we call Herod's temple, or rebuilt by them, was similar to the one in Solomon's day. Not with all the gold, not with all the wealth, however, 
the, it was it was fashion. Now this model, so people will understand what we're talking about here, is a miniature model of the one in the time of Herod or in the Roman time, or more specifically in the time of Jesus. So this is based on pictures from Israel, from different uh, photographs and uh, or temple or organizations that we've Excavations researched. And Excavate, and just right. everything you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And you can see that there is a, uh, let's, if we'll go to this and then I'll talk about Jacob's vision here in just a moment. But there was, there was an entrance here, actually have three main door entrances with doors. This is a east entrance coming into the, the compound itself. Now this is not the eastern gate, by the way. The eastern gate is actually out here. But when you come to the wall itself, which was called the Temple Mount Compound, there was a gate coming into the east. Now, when you came in here, Israelites were allowed here, and there was actually, and we didn't build this only because it's, it's a little bit better to show the open space than try to describe it, but it, this area was called the Court of the Women. The women could actually come and stand on a balcony here wow. and watch the activity that was taking place. Right. And this was the court where the Israelites would bring the, the animals and the offerings before they would enter into this area and watch the priest offer them. So this was an important area. Perry, question. As yeah. we overlay the tabernacle in the wilderness over the top of this, just pictorially right. for a moment, this was this area here was what we talked about last week as the outer court. That's right. Right. That's and, right. And this is this is uh, something new in the day of Solomon exactly. and Herod. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Uh, for example, in in in. Moses' tabernacle, this would have been the gate of the east right. coming into right. the actual building. Now what we have here is we have an expansion in the time of, what we call, I'm going to call it Herod's temple because it's not Solomon's, it's Herod's. We have this expansion where the people are allowed to come into this area here. Now, um, the historians, and some have recently come and said they don't believe this, but there seems to be evidence, and I believe it, that where the eastern gate sat, which is really way off this is the platform. The eastern right. gate is down, down here. Right. The eastern gate went directly from this chamber or this gate here through the eastern gate and you came straight across to the Mount of Olives. Right. And there appears to be evidence of a three-tiered ramp that was built over from the middle of the Mount of Olives over coming Kidron into the Valley there. Over the Kidron. See there, you know all about this. Over the Kidron Valley that yeah. came in. Now, when Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem, that's how he came in. Right. He would have come across that gate uh, into the temple area, this area here, not not in here, because right. you wouldn't bring a donkey in here. No They'd way. have stoned him if they would have done that. But he would have brought it into this area here, perhaps, while they were praising, and then he would have walked into this area here. Christ would have. And that's when the people were saying Hosanna to the king and waving the palm branches um, in, in that time. Uh, another thing that's important about this is there were actually four huge menorahs. And again, we don't put this in here because we want to keep it clean as not to confuse everybody when we show them, but we talk about this. There was a menorah here, a menorah here, there was a menorah here and here, and they were so large that the priest had to step on ladders in order to relight them. Mm -hmm. They were huge. And so you can see the activity. So all of your rejoicing and celebration with your Israelites happened here. Now, once again, there, is a, there was a balcony that extended this way around what is called the Court of the Women, where the women could come and they could watch the activity, or any Israelite could come and watch the activity. Now, if you've noticed here, I have put wooden partitions up right here, okay? I see them, yes. Now, there was an area known as the Court of the Gentiles in which a Gentile who believed in God, who believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that Gentile could come, but they were only allowed to go a certain area. It's only so close. And this is called, ready for this, the middle wall of partition. Now, you remember Paul talked about that wall of partition was broken in Christ. Right. This is what he's talking about here. Right. He's talking about that there was a, not the veil, right. which is in here we're in the talk building. about that this yeah. week. Yeah. He's talking about that the, these partitions that were built that said Gentiles. In other words, there were signs that said no Gentile allowed beyond this point. Right. And they were written in the, the language of the day. And they were posted all over here. Right. So Gentiles could come. And if you look, by, by standing here on the Temple Mount platform, you could see certain things taking place. You could watch the activity. You could hear it. But you could not go beyond certain areas unless you were true convert to Judaism to the total complete right. Jewish law. But Gentiles were permitted on this on the platform, but not past they a certain just point. just only go so far. It's they kind of, had, kind they of were like the monuments off. that uh, the children of Israel set up around, around Mount Sinai. They could only go so close to the mountain good, of good God. Good point. And no there were closer. boundaries There set. were boundaries. That's and so a this good was point. a boundary Very, for that's the right. Gentiles. Now, once you pass this area here, there were some steps that were here. Now, these steps, sometimes, uh, sometimes there would be uh, 
priests and singers and Levites that would actually sing and minister. Now, some people don't know this. I know that there are, and they're good people, but there's denominations today that don't believe in music in the church, and yet they love the Lord, but they don't think there should be music in the church. However, if we study the temple, which we do on our videotape, we go into a deep study on music at the temple, because a lot of people don't realize that the reason in the New Testament you don't hear a lot about music is music had already been established um, um, in the Feast of Israel. Oh, sure. Music had already been established at the temple. And so it was, the, you don't have to write about something people are already familiar yeah. with. So you don't have a lot of how to worship or what kind of instruments you do in the book of Psalms 150, but you don't have it in the New Testament because every Jew was already familiar. There was 120 trumpet players playing silver trumpets here. There were times that they had harps and lyres. That's lyres a big and brass and section, that's isn't it? That's huge. <laughs> I mean, when you talk about 120 t uh, trumpets, that is absolutely huge. Now, a little bit about the worship because you know there's a lot of chambers here that are numbered. And later on in another program, I'm going to show some chambers that people are going to fascinate people okay. of some things that went on here that I, I mean, I've been in church while well, I'm 44 years of age. I hate to give my age away, but I'm 44 and I've been preaching 26 years and I never heard anybody preach on these chambers. Yeah. And people are going to be fascinated because there's three of them I'm going to point out on the next program. Can't okay. do it today, but All we'll right. do that later. Now, once you pass through this East, this was the east gate. Now, this is not the famous eastern gate that we, that we read about where the man in Acts 3 was healed. That's out here again. Right. But this is the eastern gate of the inner court. That's yeah. what it's called. Now, here's what's interesting. In 30 AD, according to Jewish history, this gate that took 20 men to open and close, opened and closed all by itself. Tell and us it, about it, that. Well, there were six supernatural signs that the Jewish people have in their history that happened in the year 30 A.D. The eastern gate of the inner court opened and closed by itself. It normally took 20 men to open and close. Uh, there was a light that shone at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. There was a voice that said, let us depart he from hence. Now, that happened in the year 66 A.D. But in 30 A.D., there were six unusual signs they couldn't. The lottery, uh, which was on the Day of Atonement, where they would reach their hand in and pull, pull the, uh, the lottery that said, for the Lord or for Azazel, Right, for the scapegoats. Right, for the scapegoats. The, the, for Azazel came up in the right hand of the priest from 30 AD to 70 AD. That was a bad sign. The red thread that they used to nail to this temple door on the Day of Atonement, you know, when they threw the scapegoat off the cliff. And that would turn white. Yeah, it was supposed to turn white right. supernaturally when the, when the goat was killed. Never turned white again from 30 to 70 AD. Uh, and that's when the temple was destroyed well, again. Well, no, in 30 AD is when Jesus started his public ministry. No, I'm saying in 70 AD, Th that's right. the Romans came that's and right. destroyed Jerusalem. And destroyed the temple. Mm -hmm. So there was a generation right. from 30 to 70 AD of 40 years where these signs started coming and the priests started saying, we're what, in trouble. What's happening? What's going on yeah. here? Why but isn't what, the ribbon or the thread rather right. turning from scarlet to, to, to white? white? Why did this gate open and close by right. itself? And we, we find out when we study... Uh, what Jesus was doing at that time. Jesus was now in his public ministry being introduced as the Lamb of God. So what God was trying to tell them is through these strange signs, and I don't have time to go cover all of them, but through these strange signs, God was saying, I'm about to leave this place and make up residence somewhere else. Right. We now know what that residence is. Our body is the temple of the Spirit of God, 1 right. Corinthians uh, tells us chapter 3. So what happened is you would bring your offering and then there was our partition here and you would stand here and at that point the priest would take it and we have a ramp that goes up to the brazen altar here. Now this ramp is interesting because there were two reasons that they used a ramp and they didn't use stone steps. One reason is you did not want the priest to show his flesh. You know, the priest didn't have pants. Well, some of them had... Uh, linen pants, linen garment with a headdress, etc. But when they wore a normal, what we call priestly robe, they did not want to show their ankles or their legs above the ankles, so they used a ramp. Of course, the second reason is very simple. Animals would have a hard time walking up steps. Yes, they sure would. Very work. difficult. So this is one of the reasons why you have a ramp. Now, on this golden altar, there was a grade, and I hope you can see that right there. And I always wondered, I said, they burnt all these animals on here. What'd they do with the ashes? Well, what they would do is the priest would come in the morning and they would lift this altar up. And I don't know if I can do that or not. A little help here. Yeah, can you help me there? Okay, see there what would happen? They lift the altar and they would move it and then they would sweep out all the ashes that were under there and put them in a container, roll that container through this gate, out this way, and they would dump those ashes in the Kidron Valley every morning. Then before they would offer the lamb in the morning, which was the morning, sacrifice, they would put the altar back and then they would redo that again. Now the reason they lifted this is because there were three great fires that had to be continually burning there. So you had to lift it up, 
bring it, bring it off, get the ashes out from under it, and then put it back on. Of course, it was covered with brass, and you know the fire was not some kind of fire that was going to melt the brass. It was just enough fire to make make the uh, 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 heat. And then once they put it back, they would relight the fire, put the wood on it, okay. so that it would start the fire again for the for the morning and evening offering and for all the sacrifices. So, and 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 believe me, we're abbreviating this. There's a lot more detail, as you know. These are the Cliff Notes These version. Are, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> a lot more than what we're getting into, and you can get the information later. We'll tell you about that if you're interested. But then you come to the laver. Now the laver here, Solomon's day tells us that the laver in Solomon's day had 12 brass bulls mm -hmm. and it was on wheels. Mm -hmm. Now it held 3,000 baths of water. Now you're talking about thousands and thousands of gallons of water. And you know, um, when you talk about there was three bulls to the north, to the south, three to the east, and three to the west. And so that was in Solomon's temple. The one in Herod's day did not have the brass bulls, but nonetheless, it was a huge labor. And what happened here is this is where the priest would wash. And they would have to wash themselves before they would go into the presence of God. You know, there, there's blood on their hands from sacrifices. They'd have to wash the blood off. And they actually had a way... And we go into detail on our uh, tape on Herod's temple of how they kept this water fresh and kept it drained because they had water that would come uh, from the twin pools which was located in this direction in Jerusalem back in that day. And they had channels which were cut out of the rock and they'd fill those twin pools with water and actually bring them here. Another thing that most people don't know, because you think this is stuff you start thinking about when you study, all the blood that was there. Now you know like I do that if we brought came into the studio today and we had 10 lambs and we start offering them, there is gonna be blood all over this floor. Exactly right. So how do you get rid of the blood? What they would do is they had special grades that would come up and they would take that water from the twin pools and every um, uh, evening before the morning service they would, they would pour that water out and they would take brooms and sweep that water and there was a hole cut, a channel cut and that blood and water would go into that hole. It would go underground. It was like a septic system almost. Mm -hmm. And there, were, by the, there was by the way a septic system in the temple for the priest. And it would, that, that blood and water would go out here outside go down that ravine at the Kidron Valley and it would go into the Kidron Brook and into the Kidron Valley. Now what is interesting is when I was in Jerusalem a few years ago, they told me that the, the soil in the Kidron Valley, that we're talking about centuries ago, was so rich that they used to fight each other for it because the blood and the protein that was there, when you go down so far, it's rich, it's mm. dark, and it was the best for growing food. Of course, we know that it's like a fertilizer because sure. it's protein. Sure. Very interesting there. Now, I got to show you this. I don't know, I won't be able to get to, and you know, we were going to show people the golden altar here, and we're not going to have time to do it because there again, as we're teaching, we're going with the flow. But, but maybe what, tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow, but watch this. This is interesting. Now, this is a pole and a pole and a pole across going into the door of the holy place because th this was called outer court, uh, holy place, most holy place. And in, in Moses' tabernacle, it was outer court, inner court, and holy of holies. But, it, but in Herod's day, it, sh it shifted to a different term. Same three Saints, chambers. Mm -hmm. Same furniture in the chambers. Just a different name. Yeah, the ark is back here. Table of shoe bread, menorah, and golden altar is in here. Right. Okay, there's a veil here. I wish we could lift that up, but that's, we can't do it's that. All it's glued down. It's glued <laughs> down. Okay, this is where the veil is, right here between these two. Holy, holy of holies, holy place, outer court. Right. Now, here's what I want to show you. We didn't put little grapes on, on this because obviously they would fall off. But there were, in, uh, in the time of Jesus, there were golden grapes that hung here. Now here's what happened. If you gave an offering to the temple back in the time of Jesus or Herod's day, a certain offering, they made these gold grapes and they hung them on these poles or on these vines. In your honor? In your honor, okay. yeah. That you had given this great gift to the temple. Now here's what's interesting. That existed in Jesus' day. Now listen to this verse. I am the vine and you are the branches. It is my Father's will that you produce much fruit. You, could, you had, before you went to God's presence, you had to pass through the vine and through the branches wow. and through the fruit. Wow. See, there again, it's like, Jesus makes this statement and we only think of a natural tree right. or natural grapevine. But yet, here at the temple were these golden grapes with golden vines inter 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 intermingled that only the priest could go in. And once he went through that, he was in the presence of God. Yeah. So see, there again we have another picture that when we read a verse in the Bible, we say, hey, it's alive. 
God's Word is alive. But uh, I wish we could have got to the golden altar, but uh, I didn't get a chance to get to that. But it'll be, it'll be on the teaching well, people. It's can on get the tape, so. and Praise we'll God. maybe get to talk a little bit about it tomorrow. But symbolically here again, Perry, you've got the altar of sacrifice, the brazen laver filled with water. Yes. And both of those were prerequisites to coming into yes. the presence of God. Which is your body is a living sacrifice. Right. And of course, water baptism, repent and be baptized. Right. And then that's what brings you into the kingdom, right. say. And it's a picture of God saying, bring me a sacrifice. Yes. Bring me an offering. Absolutely. Purify and sanctify yourself. Don't come into my presence if you're not clean. Right. You know, so many times as the body of Christ, we, as Christians, we think we can just run into church or uh -huh. run into the presence of God and worship God and have a grand time. I'll tell you, there's so <laughs> much <laughs> it deep. It keeps going, It folks. keeps going. You could, you, we could be here for weeks. <laughs> I hope that you'll get ready right now with your pen and paper. Write down this telephone number that our announcer is coming to give you because we want you to have this series on the breath of the holies and mysteries of the temple. Here's our announcer. There's no other book in the world like the Bible because no matter how often you read it, whether it's once or a thousand times, every time you go back, you'll discover some new truth, a fresh revelation, some unseen insight that you hadn't seen before. That's why teachers like Perry Stone are such a gift to the body of Christ. They lead us deeper into the heart of the Lord. You know, there wouldn't be an inspiration networks if it weren't for people like you. Because of your faithfulness and obedience to God's call, we're able to reach millions of people every day across America and literally around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because of you, countless thousands of souls have been saved, lives have been transformed, relationships have been mended, people have been healed, families have been restored, financial blessings have been poured out upon people. You know, we could do so much more because the harvest is so ripe and the harvest is ready, but that's why we need to hear from you. Please call now, ask for your copy of Perry Stone's tapes and join with us as co-ministers of the gospel and we can make a powerful impact for the kingdom of God. So please pick up that phone today and call now. Welcome back to Inspiration Today. Perry Stone and I have been here today. I've been listening, he's been talking, but we've been <laughs> talking about some exciting mysteries of the Holy Temple. And I'll tell you what, there is so much revelation here, Perry, and, and what God wants to say to us. Well, I'm gonna tell you this. Tomorrow, I'm gonna get to that golden altar and I'm gonna share something that was not in the Bible, but it's something the priest did every day and it will help people to get, help get their prayers answered. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna deal with that piece of furniture, but I still gotta talk about the chambers at some point. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna get to that. We've got tomorrow and the next day. Please, if you haven't already called for your s copy of the Mystery of the Holy Temple and Breath of the Holies videos, they're two hours long each, yeah. each and one of these And they're edited states. with pictures from Jerusalem, not just this, we've edited with pictures and scriptures too, so they get to see a lot more than what they're seeing just with the models. So this is four hours of solid teaching. Well, listen, Listen, we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thanks for being with us today. Remember, all of us here at INSP are here for you. God bless you today. This program was brought to you by Inspiration TV. Help us share the inspiration. And you can support our mission online at inspiration.org forward slash give. Or call us at 800-517-6202. U.S. only. Thank you and God bless you.